Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, so thanks so much for joining us here on your lunch break. Uh, my name is Nicole Thomas and I'm a senior communications advisor with the city of Edmonton uh, in the area of housing and homelessness. And I wanna begin by acknowledging that we're coming together today on Treaty 6 territory. And we thank the diverse indigenous peoples whose ancestors footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, including the Cree, Dene, Soto, Nakota Sioux and Blackfoot peoples. We also acknowledge this as the Métis homeland and home to one of the largest Inuit communities in Southern Canada. Uh, over the last several years, the city has committed itself to helping address a critical shortage of affordable and supportive housing in Edmonton. Uh, since 2018, we have supported the creation of more than 1,500 new units of affordable and supportive housing through grant programs and land disposition. Today, we're excited to share with you our progress on the supportive housing file, which has been helped significantly by the infusion of federal funding uh, over the last year or so. <clears throat> Following the presentation, uh, we'll have time for questions. You can use the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your screen, um, or if you prefer, you can send us an email at housing at edmonton.ca, and uh, I'll be monitoring that. <clears throat> so I'll hand it over now to Colton Kersop. Colton is the manager of project development with affordable housing and homelessness at the city of Edmonton. Over to you, Colton. Good afternoon. Thank you, Nicole. Um, hoping that I am coming through loud and clear. Um, thanks again for joining us today to learn more about how the city is working to create more supportive housing. Uh, my role as manager of project development um, is uh, one where I work, uh, work collaboratively to uh, fast track the creation of 900 units of permanent supportive housing. Um, the activities that make that happen are buying land for affordable housing, um, getting land use approvals like rezonings, um, having municipal reserve removed and things like that nature, and navigating public engagement and city council approvals, including developing surplus school sites. Uh, interdepartmental collaboration has been a, has been critical to this work and has really helped us establish a pipeline of city land for affordable housing. We've also established and oversee a grant program in our affordable housing investment plan, uh, and that has also helped us uh, leverage um, more housing investment. Next slide. So I'll start with a bit of background on the issue that we're working to solve. Uh, as I'm sure many people watching today know there has been considerable increase in the number of unhoused people in Edmonton over the last two years. According to Homeward Trust's by names list, there are currently more than 2,800 Edmontonians without a permanent home. About 1,600 are provisionally housed. That is, they might be uh, couch surfing with friends or family, uh, taking up a spot in a spare bedroom, or they might be in transitional or bridge housing. While the rest of us are uh, sleeping safely at home, they are in emergency shelters or unfortunately living outside overnight. Uh, prior to the pandemic, Edmonton, led by Homeward Trust and the homeless serving agencies that it supports, had made significant progress towards ending homelessness. Nearly 1,300 people have been housed since 2009, and the number of unhoused people that have had fallen to about 1,500, which is an overall reduction of about 45%. However, COVID-19 and the resulting economic fallout have increased inflows into homelessness and slowed outflows uh, out of homelessness. All of this has led us to the highest levels of homelessness um, since 2014, and we are approaching our previous peak levels, which we saw back in 2006 and 2008. So Edmonton is considered a leader among Canadian cities in addressing homelessness through its Housing First programs. Housing First helps people access housing with no preconditions, such as employment or sobriety, and provides them with whatever housing support they need uh, to maintain their housing. This can include placement in supportive housing, which provides 24 seven wraparound supports that are on site for people with complex needs, and in 2017, Homeward Trust identified supportive housing as a critical missing piece in Edmonton's housing ecosystem, which also includes other types of affordable housing like deep subsidy or social housing for people who need significant financial assistance 
but are able to live independently on their own and near market rental housing for people who just need a little bit of assistance financially to make uh, ends meet and their housing costs are managed. In 2017, uh, the plan to prevent and end homelessness determined that 916 units of supportive housing were needed to help fill a gap in Edmonton at that time. The city has been involved in supporting the development of affordable housing since the 1950s. We at the city had different roles over time. Sometimes we've been a developer, at other times we've been a funder, and at other times we've been an owner or a land provider, and we are still today a regulator and an advocate and a planner uh, in terms of uh, affordable housing and housing with supports. Currently, we primarily focus on incentivizing the development of supportive and affordable housing by providing land, capital grants, and public engagement support to our non-market housing partners. Having identified supportive housing as a priority in terms of housing need, um, and it was, I should, I should honestly point out, it was city council that identified that as uh, the priority. Uh, we partnered with Homeward Trust on four new supportive housing sites in late 2019. What you see, it on, see on the slide here is essentially a scrapbook of our early plans and how they were progressing in the first half of 2020. We had selected four locations for supportive housing developments in the neighborhoods of Inglewood, King Edward Park, Wellington, and Terrace Heights. Our plan was to sell the land for $1 to Homeward Trust, who would then develop the sites using traditional construction methods on a traditional timeline uh, where they would build these buildings in about two to three years and then um, have them fully uh, occupied. The work was underway when the federal government launched its rapid housing initiative to quickly create affordable housing across Canada. The rapid housing initiative or RHI uh, is a $1 billion investment from the government of Canada to support the construction of up to 3000 new affordable housing units across Canada for the most vulnerable. The program is delivered by CMHC under the National Housing Strategy, and it provides capital contributions for modular multi-unit rental housing construction or the conversion of non-residential to affordable multi-residential housing, and also the rehabilitation of buildings in disrepair or that might be abandoned. Rapid Housing Initiative takes a human rights-based approach to housing, serving people experiencing or at risk of homelessness and others who are among the most vulnerable, including women and children, fleeing domestic violence, seniors, young adults, indigenous peoples, people with disabilities, and people dealing with mental health and addiction issues, veterans, and the LGBTQ plus community, as well as racialized groups, black Canadians and recent immigrants or refugees. There are two funding streams under Rapid Housing Initiative. The city stream, which provides block funding directly to municipalities with the highest levels of renters in severe housing need and people experiencing homelessness. And there is also the project stream, which provides funding for projects put forward by municipalities, provinces, territories, and nonprofit housing bodies. Um, it was critical that the new funding path was created partly in response to advocacy and feedback from municipalities like Edmonton, uh, municipalities that had identified a gap in the national housing strategy, which was housing specifically for people who are experiencing homelessness. In total, the city has received $35.1 million during the first round of the rapid housing initiative, which allowed us to add a fifth site uh, you think you'll remember the last slide I mentioned that there were four permanent housing sites, permanent supportive housing sites. Um, and in light of this um, funding opportunity, we quickly obtained uh, a fifth site so that we could um, make use of this amazing program and build more units of housing for those in the most need in Edmonton. So uh, our projects are uh, currently literally going up as we speak uh, using modular construction. When we say modular, it sometimes brings to mind temporary housing, uh, trailers or workhouse housing, but that is not the case um, in these projects. Um, in these projects, modular housing is really um, just a method of construction um, that differs in that uh, our, our apartments are being built 
in pieces or modules in a factory. And so they're being built right now by Northgate Industries. Uh, there is a production line uh, just south of the Yellowhead, um, north of Blatchford, and there's another one in HSN Industrial in Parkland County. Um, this uh, method of preparation allows um, us to be uh, preparing the site that's gonna receive the building at the same time as we are building the building. So we shorten the construction timeline considerably. Um, the building will then be assembled on site. A couple of weeks ago, uh, the uh, project at, on White Avenue in King Edward Park, um, all the modules were assembled in a matter of days. And so the building is now built out. Um, the supportive housing buildings are made up of studio and one bedroom barrier-free apartments. Once assembled, they will be indistinguishable from a typical apartment building. As with the rest of the construction industry, we have experienced labor and supply chain disruptions. Oh my gosh, uh, I can tell you there were a lot of delays getting um, enough dimensional lumber to get these modules going. Uh, but we have um, found uh, ways to overcome those challenges. Our construction manager um, encounter encountered shortages and long lead times for things like lumber, steel, flooring, steel doors, drywall, and even shower units. Um, but as, I, as, I, as you can see, construction is underway and completion is targeted for early 2022 um, with occupancy shortly thereafter. So uh, we have a video uh, that we will play uh, right now. And it's the first modular installation taking place at the beginning of this month at King Edward Park site. Within a week, all the modules were in place. Work is now underway inside um, connecting all of the utilities and uh, the cladding on the exterior of the building will go up soon. Um, you know, when I was on site and I saw the first units being hoisted up, um, and when I saw the units being built at North Cape plant, it made me realize how many hands are a part of this effort. It takes a small army of people here on the ground uh, to get these homes built, reflecting on that coordination uh, and how much of it is required uh, was really quite amazing to me. Um, there was obviously community trepidation to overcome at the outside set of this work. We had a lot of conversations with communities. Um, they had lots of questions and mostly uh, it had to do with how to understand supportive housing, how it works, um, how it will look and how it will feel. And I think that the, the takeaway for me is that that's just an important part of the process to get through. Um, once complete ownership of the buildings will be transferred to Homer Trust, um, which will contract um, some social service agencies to run the day-to-day -day operations of these sites. Um, and so these five sites represent 210 new homes that will make an immeasurable difference in the lives of the people that will live in them. Uh, it will certainly help relieve the strain that's been placed on the homeless serving sector and reduce the number of people uh, living in encampments in our city. So I'll quickly share uh, the renderings of the buildings that are currently under construction. These were designed by GEC Architecture in Edmonton. Uh, the top row you'll see um, uh, from left to right shows uh, terrace heights. Uh, the building is white. Uh, King Edward Park, which is on White Avenue, is in the middle. Um, and then you'll see the next building over is Inglewood. And then in the bottom row, we have um, uh, Wellington or MacArthur Industrial, it's kind of straddles the boundary of two neighborhoods. So that's the yellow and white building. And the Westmount site is uh, the last image. Um, an interesting factoid about the buildings, you may notice that there's some parts of the buildings that are screened. And um, those are large room sized exterior balconies. And there um, is a colored metal privacy screen. Um, uh, wrapping around those balconies. And that's so that there's some uh, outdoor amenity space, but also has a, you know, a component of privacy. Inglewood doesn't have a screened in balcony area because it's instead uh, on the rooftop. That's where the amenity area is for residents in that building. So lessons learned. Um, really, I would say that having shovel ready projects is key. Um, our goal was to create 600 new units by 2022 and another 300 by 2024, so a total of 900 units. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to make the progress we've made today without actually sequentially doing the work and getting the land use approvals, identifying where we were going to put buildings, finding partners to build and operate them. So far, we have um, approval and funding 
for 538 units of supportive housing, and we're confident that we're going to meet those big goals of 600 and 900. It's important to note that the city has other avenues for creating supportive housing aside from the rapid housing initiative, and that includes our affordable housing investment program, which provides capital grants to non market housing builders. Right now, we have two pieces of land for sale that are prioritized for supportive housing, and we have another round of affordable housing investment plan grants uh, coming up. We'll be opening up our program for intake in January. And um, the Rapid Housing Initiative brought some key points into sharp focus for us. It demonstrated the importance of having shovel-ready projects on the conveyor belt. Um, we would not have been able to accomplish what we did on the first five sites if we had been starting from scratch. It also underscored how critical it is for all orders of government to work together to address uh, the need for housing, the urgency of this issue and the tight turnaround uh, required under the rapid housing initiative, both during the application process and the delivery process, illustrated how important it is for the municipality to be nimble, to be solution oriented and uh, to be willing to think outside the typical box. Uh, at the city, uh, we've taken these lessons forward and we continue to take it forward in our housing work. Having seen this success, we know it's possible to end homelessness if we work collectively uh, to offer the right kind of housing and supports. And with that, I would be happy to take some of the questions from the audience. Thank you. So I've got the... Uh... The Q&A tool open if anyone wants to uh, share a question there. Uh, or you can send it into housing at edmonton.ca. I'm not seeing any questions come in yet, so I'll ask you, Colton, what's the... Uh, what is the construction schedule like for the rest of the sites? When will the other um, modules be placed on the other buildings? Um, so I believe the next building to have modules will be Inglewood. If they aren't receiving them now, it'll be uh, later this week or early next week. And then uh, each of the next um, buildings uh, will be receiving their modules on a month by month basis. So sequentially after this, um, the next project that receives modules We'll get them, there'll be two in December, there'll be one in January, and the building should be complete and ready for occupancy uh, by uh, also in that sort of sequential manner uh, from early spring to late spring. And it doesn't, the, the winter doesn't impact the, uh, the placement of the, of the mods? No, it doesn't. Um, that's another one of the most beautiful things about this process is um, we're able to uh, essentially truck them from their climate controlled warehouses where their assembly line is located, um, get them uh, parked on the street in front of the building and they're craned into place uh, one after another. And like you saw in the video, by the end of the week, the building's um, mass and bulk is complete and it's a matter of connecting utilities and doing some finishing work going from there. Um, I do see one question, which is, which is, are we sending out the slides? And yes, certainly we can uh, send out the slides to everyone who's attended uh, after, after the presentation ends. Oh, okay, here's, here's a question. What does it mean when you say non-market housing builders? Uh, good question. So uh, non-market housing is uh, affordable housing. It could be supportive housing, it could be social housing. But when I say non-market housing, I just mean... Um, that it is uh, subsidized, it is an affordable form of housing and non-market housing providers or builders are uh, organizations like the Salvation Army or Right at Home Housing Society. They are uh, typically nonprofits. They might have a charitable arm or not and they build, operate and maintain and manage um, affordable or non-market housing. Uh, are the partner organizations already contracted for the operation and staffing of these specific sites? Uh, good question. Uh, right now, um, I understand that Homer Trust is in the process of, of, of uh, 
if they haven't had an RFP posted, one will be shortly. Um, and then they will be uh, going through uh, that process of uh, operator selection in the coming, in coming weeks. Do you use universal housing design? Oh yeah, absolutely. It's also a requirement of rapid housing initiative uh, that we exceed local uh, accessible housing design requirements. So uh, just being honest, like not every unit will be universally accessible, but we'll be exceeding the Alberta building code requirements by, uh, by 10%. Could you just explain a little bit about what universal housing design is just for folks who might not know? Sure, yes, it means uh, doorways are wider so that people in a wheelchair or a power scooter of some kind can um, make their way through the facility. Um, the, the kitchen, for example, has lower countertops um, or can be adaptable to um, uh, changes in a person's height. Washrooms have to have additional um, turning radius for someone to, again, if they're in a, in a wheelchair or a power uh, mobility device, so they can get around and you know all of the grabs, uh, grab bars are in the shower and around the toilet, things like that. So it's really meant uh, so that a person of um, challenged mobility um, or somebody that might be, um, they might have a chronic disease where over time they will be losing their ability, they can live in that unit successfully for uh, the length of their tenancy. Um, here's a question about the uh, the land disposition process. So it says you referred to land Edmonton provides to nonprofits and as well as the grants. Um, are the I guess you can speak to both of them. Are the grants as well as the land paid for uh, from Edmonton's own budget, i.e., from the city's taxpayers? Yes, it is. Um, so what we did with affordable housing investment plan, which is our sort of overarching plan for affordable housing at the city of Edmonton. Uh, that goes forward to council's uh, four-year budget cycle and our total package for four years uh, funding envelope was 132 million dollars and so um, that comes out on a sort of an overtime over the four-year basis out of the tax levy and um, we use that to acquire land some of that land is already owned by the city like those first four sites that all came out of existing city holdings but uh, at the end of the day, uh, it does come from the city's budget process. Now, here's a question from uh, the EFCL, the Edmonton Federation of Community Leagues. Um, one of the big, I think I have that right. Uh, one of the big indicators of success in housing individuals is the welcome and integration of folks into our communities. How can leagues help to create some uh, systems of support and care to leverage these investments and the work that your team is doing? Oh, that's uh, wonderful to hear. I think actually just hearing that sentiment is the starting place. Um, having uh, leagues uh, express an interest in wanting to um, wanting to provide support and care or messages of support uh, is fantastic. And I think we can work with individual leagues and, and have in some cases with the first four projects. Some leagues were extremely uh, welcoming um, and we can introduce people through our good neighbor plan process, which is um, meant to introduce the operators and the housing developers to community leagues um, and residents. Um, and that's a process of introduction and relationship building that I think can unfold and great things can come from that. Um, once we have helped facilitate that introduction, um, I think leagues and operators could sustain those conversations and they can they can take that relationship where they want um, but it's a wonderful to see that that that, I, that ideation is out there another question what is the breakdown for each site uh, for the different levels of housing support um that is i think uh I guess I'm not the best person to answer that question. I know that we have one of the sites, the Wellington MacArthur site is a higher level of, um, the residents there will have a high, will need a higher level of care. And so that site has been identified uh, for that, but I can't really speak to the, the way the other uh, four sites break out. Um, I just know that they're a uh, lower, uh, one step down in the sort of continuum of care. 
I would say, yeah, I'd say to to questions that maybe Homeward Trust or or eventually the operators are in a better position to answer. Um, if you go to our the city's website, which is edmonton.ca slash supportive housing, uh, there's the mailing list sign up link there uh, where you can sign up for updates. And through that list, uh, we'll share information on the operators once they're selected. And then um, and then those types of questions, you'll have a, a better uh, someone who's in a better position to answer them. So if you're interested in following along, I'd recommend going to our website uh, and uh, and signing up for that mailing list. And I'll 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 include that in the um, the follow up email as well. Uh, here's a question: Is the city working to simplify or expedite the rezoning for future projects or housing units that could be used to help the current challenges of the houseless community? We're seeing a bit of resistance and nimbyism. So it's a challenge. Yeah, I think uh, I would answer that question by saying, you know, the city took some steps in, in mid to late 2019 to make supportive housing um, a, a use in the zoning bylaw. It literally was made into an, its own definition and it replaced some, some more limiting uh, and some may say discriminatory uh, definitions in the bylaw. And that use was put on a more even keel with other forms of multi-unit residential housing. Because uh, at the end of the day, it is very similar to that. And there's uh, on-site supports to manage any potential uh, off-site impacts. So uh, by doing that work, we've actually created um, more opportunity for supportive and affordable housing across the city. And um, that has really helped us um, expedite the process of permitting uh, supportive housing because it's a permitted use now in over 50 residential zones. So the rezoning process wasn't really sped up, the permitting process was. Um, if we have a site that we need to rezone, um, we do follow the city's um, normal rezoning procedures and we do provide opportunities for engagement and conversation around that as well as the typical public hearing process. Um, I hear from other modular housing unit developers that this type of building prevents infestations like bed bugs, for example, um, because each unit is separate. Is that accurate? Um, I don't know. I think it might it might um, it might prevent infestations from spreading throughout the whole building, but I'm not sure that the construction method in and of itself prevents um, you know an initial infestation. Um, it definitely makes it easier to contain uh, because each of these modules is pretty much a sealed unit um, or they're, they're two sealed units potentially. The construction quality is a lot higher and more durable than conventional construction. Um, I was very impressed when I walked the production floor at Northgate and saw how durable these units are. Uh, each one is its own um, like the finishes are incorporated into the construction from the get-go. And so they're, they're quite solid. Um, and I think uh, the product will last as long or longer than any conventional building. So I think we'll see these um, buildings in our communities for anywhere from 50 to 100 years. Uh, can you speak to the level of community engagement uh, for the neighborhoods where the uh, housing is being built? Was it uh, supportive or uh, or negative? Is there anything Edmontonians can do to encourage community engagement? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, we need to position this this housing as the solution. I think there's a lot of people that are worried about um, more crime or more disorder in their neighborhood. To be honest, that crime and disorder is already in our city. And this housing is actually meant to address that, to redirect these people from living unsheltered on the street or they are subject to a lot of victimization uh, or they might even be perpetrating it. Um, but the solution is actually housing with supports. So the message I have is um, your community will be safer and better off by having this housing. Um, and uh, that um, conversation is an important conversation. I mean, neighborhoods are collections of people and we do have our anxieties and, and uh, we are inquisitive and we want to know, we're curious, like, how does this work? And so it's totally acceptable to have those conversations. And I think that's a part of the, 
the process that we have to get through. Um, so by no means do we want to ram these through, um, but we do want to demystify, we do want to learn what, what concerns community have, and we do want to introduce operators and community to each other so that they can have productive conversations um, if issues do arise down the road and they have already met each other. They know who each other are and they know how to have a, a conversation um, uh, when one needs to take place. And I'll just say too, um, during the engagement for the first, uh, first well, first five sites, the first four were done together and then West Mount was done separately, but um, we had uh, we had a lot of community conversations, well, virtually, um, because this was all during COVID. Um, we had some really good information sessions uh, that are up on our website with um, folks from Homer Trust, um, an operator, um, not necessarily one of these sites, but from Bissell Center, just to uh, give a to give an idea of what day to day life is like inside supportive housing, and um, as well as uh, Inspector Dan Jones from the EPS, he's done a lot of work. Uh, around supportive housing and he really understands um, the benefits it can bring and he talks a lot so what, what Colton was saying about um, the victimization of people who are experiencing homelessness or the um, the criminalization of homelessness so a lot of you know things that you can do when you're inside your own house are illegal if you're outside so that's where we start to see this association with um, with homelessness and social disorder or crime. But once someone is housed, that, that really just kind of falls away. And I think that was really also well demonstrated with some of the stories that we collected that Homer Trust helped us collect um, from people who are in supportive housing. And again, these are up on the website, which I'll share, but um, they're very, uh, you know, folks, once they've moved in, really value this sort of quiet, um, calm, restful life because they haven't had that for some time so um it's it's getting those that understanding out there that's really important it's something to share with uh, community members um but we do like colton said again we're not going to um we want people to ask their their honest questions and, and share their fears so that we can help you know work through that okay uh just a couple more before we Ooh, there's a few more, so I'll try to get through them quickly. Um, are these sites required to be operated on a harm reduction model, or is that determined during discussions with Homer Trust and the partner organization? Um, they are not required uh, to operate on a harm reduction model, but that is one of the models that could um, that could operate uh, in a supportive housing site. But um, those those conversations um, are really being led by Homer Trust. And um, so I don't really think I can comment any further. Um, one question here, um, I think you, well, you've mentioned this already, um, but what is, the, what is the makeup of the units? Their studio and one bedroom. Can you speak to um, whether these will be for um, two or three bedrooms or, or families? Uh, in these first five projects, uh, they are 50-50 uh, mix of studios and one-bedroom apartments. Um, the one-bedrooms are set up so that it's possible that if there are couples that they may be able to be housed in those units. Um, but uh, we don't, in, the, in, these, in these developments, we don't have any two or three bedroom units for families in these ones. Okay, and I think this is the last, uh... The last question we can get to before we wrap up. So does the funding include staffing, specifically mental health and other specialist staff? Is there a long-term funding in place uh, to do this more often and build more units? So I think those are two, two questions. One, is there um, operating funding? And two, is there more capital funding to build more in the future? Yeah, so great question. Uh, Rapid Housing Initiative, um, they've, um, they have had a second round um, and the city has um, identified a couple of projects they would like to contribute funding to. So there is uh, ongoing funding through Rapid Housing Initiative. There's, um, uh, there's also um, conversations ongoing right now around uh, securing operating funding. These projects are predominantly um, going to require some, some additional supports and some additional supports have already been committed by Alberta Health Services. So it's a bit of an evolving conversation and uh, it involves uh, all orders of government. 
and I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay, I, I'm sorry, there's still a few more questions in the chat, but we do have to wrap it up. So uh, if, if I can, I'll, I'll try to respond to these in the chat um, afterwards, but just want to thank everyone so much uh, for coming uh, over their lunch hour to learn about these projects. Um, and I will send around the slides, uh, as well as a link to a video that we, um, that we released yesterday uh, on National Housing Day, uh, which gives uh, even more, uh, more of a look into homelessness in our city right now, uh, as well as, as the progress we're making on these buildings. Uh, so thanks very much, everybody, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.